this time on The Gadget Show. You'd better get ready to rumble. Otis and I face the glorious challenge of building a high-tech and awesomely fierce fighting robot. Oh, yeah. Oh, man! I see that. You'll see smashing melons, exploding TVs, extreme robo-violence, and two very excited Gadget Show presenters as we create a unique and gloriously vicious bit of tech. And I get to grips with a much less aggressive gadget as I test drive a human-powered submarine and race it against a gold medal winning champion. And John tests the latest crop of bridge cameras by taking them on holiday to the Caribbean. Welcome to the Gadget Show. Now, I think it's fair to say that this week's challenge is one for the boys. Oh, yeah, definitely one for the tough guys of the team. All I'm trying to say, so is no disrespect, is in order to win this week's challenge, you know, you need more than a cheeky smile and a pair of long legs. <laughs> All right? <laughs> a little bit of grit is required this week. Yeah. Determination. A bit of testosterone. Butchness. Yeah, and above all, an unhealthy interest in the concept of gadgets that fight each other and destroy things and make as much damage as possible. You said it, sister. Seek and destroy. Murder, death, kill. Obviously, we're being ironic, aren't we? Oh, yeah, of yeah. course. I mean, I didn't enjoy a single moment of the challenge. No. No, no, I'd much rather been at home, you know, internet shopping for shoes. Oh, I, I think it did as well. The challenge began with Otis and me being summoned to a small factory on the outskirts of Birmingham. OK, so here we are, indoors, albeit still in the cold, yeah. Jason. No, it's always this cold, isn't it? What happens now? Well, normally, you know, some researcher sort of lay out of bed, yeah. runs up with some manky old envelope in uh -huh. which there's, uh, there's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are we employing robots now, Jason? That looks like our Stop challenge. It. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nice, nice to meet you too. Jason and Otis, your challenge is to design and build a fighting robot yes. to compete in a specially arranged challenge match in three weeks' time. Awesome! Brilliant, brilliant. You'll be pitched against three of the country's top fighting robots, including the European champion. Nice. Three weeks? Yeah. That's more than enough time. Easy! Just think about oh. the kind of weaponry and functionality oh, we can man. build into this thing. I absolutely agree with you. Jace, yeah? should we take him for scrap? Yeah, we should use some of his yeah, part, yeah, that yeah. gripping hand thing. Are you, you going to grab him? Or... Uh, no, you grab him. Quickly, yeah. Uh -huh. Robot Wars started as an American competition that spawned a mega successful British TV series. But while the TV show is long gone, the idea of building robots that fight is still very popular, with tournaments held regularly around the globe. Our creation would have to face three other fighting robots in a special tournament. If we won the majority of our fights, we'd also win the challenge. Our first task was to decide what type of fighting robot to build and what sort of weaponry it should use. To aid in our research, we'd been provided with four very mean fighting bots, each fitted with a classic weapon that has proved itself again and again in battle. So that we could test out the capabilities of our fighting robots, we thought we'd set out an assault course. So we've got melons here to see how well they crush their opponents. Yeah, baked beans over here yeah. uh, to test out the piercing capability of the robots because after all, these things are under high pressure and they're made of steel. Television sets! Because when the robots come up, well, what, just because? Yeah, really? just because you can smash them up and they look good. Yeah. And check yeah. this out. A car door, look. Oh. Jason, you're right. All right, no, it's good. You, you sure? I, um, it's bad. Could you get the St. John's? Uh, medic. Oh. Despite these robots being no bigger than a large RC car, they're not toys. They are seriously dangerous, which is why we moved behind safety glass as our first robot, Little Hitter, was powered up. Destruction! Let me do it, man. Right, right, right. Oh, man! Did you see that? Check it out, man! Its awesome axe is powered by feeding pressurised CO2 into a cylinder. Eat my axe! This moves a piston that in turn swings its deadly blade. Fuck oh, oh, on! Bullseye, right in the top! Even the steel tins were no match for the axe. Oh, look at the hole in the top of the telly! <laughs> That's beautiful! Yeah. And the tellies? Well, they were history. Quick, yeah? Wait, 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 wait. Slow down, slow down, slow down. We were seriously impressed, but after little more than ten strikes, it was out of gas. Nah, it's run out of power, you see. That's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, if it's got no stamina in a fight, we'll, nah. be, we'll be running or sitting ducks, actually. Absolutely. Next, we got to play with Venom. 
This is not as quick as the others, but with a powerful electric crusher that's capable of applying 150 kilograms of force, it's just as lethal. <laughs> Look at that. Although it didn't make much of an impression on our car door. <laughs> that's not impressive. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not impressive. Look. Oh, I've taken the sheen off the metallic. Next up, little flipper. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. You need to understand. Yeah. It didn't flip it. It just ripped through it. Ripped it to pieces, yeah. Powered by CO2, it has enough power to flip a large motorbike over. Oh, and it seemed to have more stamina than the axe. But positioning was everything. Get it right, and things flew. I can't get over how powerful it's these machines are. It's incredible. I mean, they're all amazing, but this especially has just raw, instant power. Yeah. Our final test robot was DB5. Oh! <laughs> no way! <laughs> There's metal everywhere, man. Its steel tipped spinner rotates at 4,000 RPM. It's quick, it's deadly, and it's very difficult to defend against. <laughs> So satisfying. <laughs> Why did two relatively intelligent grown men get so much pleasure from mushing a melon? Yeah. Here's what we'd learned. The axe was good but short-lived. The crusher, well, that just wasn't us. The flipper and spinner, on the other hand, were awesome. And if we could combine the two, we reckoned we'd have the makings of a world beater. Oh! <laughs> right with you! All that... What's your favourite? Yeah, I like that. That? Or that. I like that, <laughs> but I like the flip. I like yeah, the, the flip. flip's good. It's a real crowd pleaser, but also it's got some real energy behind it. Absolutely. It can flip 20 stone. A 20 stone men. We, we, I wanted to actually test that, but we couldn't find any 20 stone men, could we? Well, quite unfortunate that day. Yeah. Listen, how exciting. I really wish I'd have been there. How, how much do you weigh? Not 20 stone. OK. Time for a break now, but still to come. John's got away with it again. He's testing the latest crop of bridge cameras. And whereas he insisted on going to carry out those tests, the Caribbean. It's the light, apparently. And while he's over there selling himself, I'm in the swimming pool in Bath. Although I do get to test a rather clever human-powered submarine. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about digital cameras and these bridge cameras in particular. Bridge cameras aim to be the perfect compromise between compact point-and-shoot snappers and more sophisticated, bulkier SLR cameras. Like compacts, they've got fixed lenses and reasonable price tags. However, those fixed lenses look more like something you'd find on the front of an SLR camera. And with their super long zooms and lots of extra controls, you might expect closer to SLR standard results. So, are bridge cameras the perfect compromise, or are they just compromised? Well, to find out, I headed off to the Caribbean. I'd escaped to the beautiful Turks and Caicos Islands, a perfect holiday location in which to compare the long zooms, video functionality and wealth of features bridge cameras offer. And coming with me every step of the way will be these three. I had the Panasonic FZ38, complete with a 12.1 megapixel sensor, 18 times optical zoom and HD video capabilities. The Sony HX1, boasting a 20 times zoom and 9.1 megapixel sensor, as well as HD video. And finally, the S200 EXR from Fuji. With its 12 megapixel sensor and 14 times zoom lens, it looks the most like an SLR. And for my first test, I've come to a remote island that's home to 2,000 indigenous rock iguanas. Now, where are they? Here I was going to get to grips with the long zooms that should help me get good close-up shots, starting with the Panasonic. It's a very compact camera, but it's still quite good to hold. It focuses quickly, and although the shutter wasn't quite as responsive as I'd have liked, before long I was taking some great close-up shots. However, I was even more impressed with the Sony and its astonishing 20 times zoom lens. That long zoom, coupled with the really effective close-focusing ability, is helping me get really iguana frame-filling shots. The Sony is very feature-rich too, sporting a tilting LCD screen and 10 frames per second fast shooting mode. Not that I needed that with my languid subjects. 
It's also got an automatic panorama mode that allows you to get a panoramic shot smoothly and easily. Ooh, let's have a look at that. Hmm, not bad. The Fuji is a much bigger camera. It actually feels like a digital SLR. There's a chunky hand grip, lots of separate knobs, a focusing ring, and a zoom ring on the lens. And this satisfying manual control allowed me to grab some really great tight shots really easily. Ooh, I didn't suppose that counts. So all three had performed well in test one. But the Sony was just shading it with its longer zoom and closer focus. For test two, I wanted to compare their video recording, a feature of bridge cameras that's often missing on more expensive SLRs. To do so, I hit the water to film a professional water skier in action and began with the Panasonic. Now, the Panasonic takes its video very seriously. There's a dedicated button to get you into record, and it shoots high-definition widescreen at 720p resolution. The colours were really impressive, but an occasional stuttering marred the video playback, so I moved on to the Sony. Now, with the Sony, you don't get a dedicated video button. You've got to swing the dial around to movie and then uh, hit the shutter release. And the Sony's smoother recording of movement made for a much steadier, colour-rich video. Next up was the Fuji, and to be honest, I wasn't too hopeful. Disappointingly on the Fuji, there's no high definition, no widescreen, it's just 640 by 480 resolution and mono sound. And the low quality really showed. With poor clarity and inaccurate colours, the Fuji's video was easily the worst. Test 2 was now complete, and the Sony was still in the lead. So I returned to dry land and let the sun go down before beginning Test 3. Of course, you don't just want to take pictures during the day on holiday, you also want to take pictures of the nighttime action as well. And that's when bridge cameras with their smaller sensors have traditionally been much less good than digital SLRs. Let's see how these three get on. I joined a Caribbean beach party, complete with colourful dancers and local performers. And they'd be my subjects. The Panasonic has more powerful optical image stabilisation than its predecessors, so obviously that'll help you get a steady shot, but it doesn't help freeze the movement of the subject. And the low-light shots had a disappointing amount of grain and digital noise. Next, I tried the Sony, which has a trick up its sleeve. The Sony's got a special twilight non-flash mode. Let's try that. The camera takes six images and combines them to reduce the blur. It worked very well, and I also got good results using the flash. The party was now in full swing, and I couldn't resist joining in the fun. But soon enough, I had to give the maracas back and pick up the Fuji. The Fuji uses its EXR sensor to double up its pixels when it gets dark, which reduces the amount of noise you might otherwise get in the picture. And I was mightily impressed, as even without the flash, I was getting some of the best images of the night. Now for the G ratings, and it's three Gs for the Fuji. It looks and feels most like a digital SLR, but I can't overlook the very disappointing video performance. The Panasonic also gets three Gs. It can produce superb stills, but its low-light noise and slightly slow responses do irritate. Finally, the Sony gets four Gs. With its good range of features and impressive video, it's a great halfway house between compact and SLR, and is definitely my favourite. Whether you're talking cameras, TVs, games or any other type of gadget, the Gadget Show website at www.5.tv slash gadget show is the place to go to find out exactly what are the best gadgets to buy. In our appropriately named Best Buys section, you'll find recommendations of what we think are the best buys for any budget for pretty much any gadget. Right, now it's time for a top five. And for this, we need to get a little bit slinky and a little bit gorgeous. Because here come our top five sexy gadgets. As Gadget Show presenters, we're often in the envy-inducing position of trying out the very best gadgets on the market. And while we're usually looking for function over form, today we could indulge in both, as we'd gathered together gadgets that not only work well, but also look gorgeous. Look at this display of tech. It's a positive plethora of some of the most sumptuous and sexy gadget around. And the four of us have one important task, to decide which is sexy enough to make our top five. 
we had some of the best-looking TVs, phones, cameras, speakers and music players currently available. But it didn't take long for arguments to break out. OK, guys, over here, the Samsung LED 7000. Come on, in the last year, this has to be the sexiest TV release. I'm not sure if it's as iconic, though, as, as the Lerva. I love this. No. No. And so, after much deliberation, argument and fun... Can I put this forward? The LG Chocolate. Uh, it's so hard, isn't it? Mm. Design is such a personal thing. I oh. still adore no. this phone. No. I, still, I adore no. this phone. We settled on our top five sexy gadgets. <laughs> and at number five, it's the fully functional yet amazingly cool LG watch phone. People have been dreaming about watch phones for the last 60 or 70 years, but LG are the first people to make it a desirable market reality. With touchscreen, built-in camera and MP3 player, it's a perfect blend of style and function. Can I have that one? Mm, thanks. <laughs> You're not going to get that back, John. At number four, it's the Bowers & Wilkins Zeppelin iPod dock. The most elegant iPod dock around, and with stunning sound, it really isn't style over function. Oh, and it's so inviting with its polished stainless steel iPod dock. Go on, Otis, put your iPod in. OK. Oh, that, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, for, for such a small device, it really is a design success, isn't it? It also looks good from the back. At number three, it's the Apple Magic Mouse, the world's first multi-touch sensitive mouse. Now, you might think a mouse is just a mouse, but this not only looks really good, it also gives you almost the total functionality of your laptop's trackpad on top of your mouse. So you can zoom in and out of stuff, you can flick back through things, practically everything apart from, actually, the pinch and zoom on pictures, but I'm sure that'll come on the Mark II version. And number two, we've chosen the sexiest computer on the market, Dell's Adamo laptop. <gasps> Look at this for sexiness to open it. Oh, a little slide of the finger. <laughs> Remember all that hoo-ha about the MacBook Air? Well, this is a take on that, but it's got a raised keyboard. It's also better equipped than the MacBook Air with two USB ports and a 13.4-inch widescreen HD display. It's absolutely mm. beautiful. Yeah. Interestingly, it's the world's thinnest laptop. It's thinner than the, the MacBook Air and any other laptop on the planet at just 9.9 millimetres. <gasps> And at number one are the Nautilus speakers, the flagship offering from renowned audio experts Bowers & Wilkins. Now, you can't argue with the visual appeal of these babies. I mean, look at the shell design and the go-faster conage. The spiral-shaped body is said to eliminate every trace of internal resonance, making the Nautilus one of the most true loudspeakers ever built, with no cavity coloration whatsoever in its sound. Yeah, I agree. They're like a Henry Moore sculpture. They just sort of sit there and you, you want to stare at them. Right, time for another quick break now, but after that... Fighting robots! Yeah! And Susie in a swimsuit. TV doesn't get much better than this. Welcome back. Now it's time for me and possibly one of the most exhausting pieces of tech that I've ever tested on The Gadget Show. When they told me and they gave me the assignment that I was going to test a submarine, I thought, yay, how cool and how relaxing. However, I then found out that it would be powered by me. It's a human-powered submarine. This is the Sea bomb Built by Bath University undergraduates, this amazing human-powered sub competed in the annual international submarine race in Washington, D.C., where it came second in class at its very first attempt. And the very kind students have said that I can have a go, although Trevor informs me that it's quite hard work powering it through the water. Yes, Trevor's nodding. The Sea bomb is a wet sub, which means it completely fills with water. It's made from different density fiberglass materials on an aluminium frame to give it neutral buoyancy. This allows the sea bomb to dive and surface without needing to vent and fill ballast tanks with air, as traditional subs do. But that also means you have to plumb into the sea bomb's onboard air supply. To propel the sea bomb along, I'm having to push down on the two foot bars alternately, and this makes those flexible plastic foils on the side flat. Yes! Yes, this is brilliant! I'm moving! This propulsion system is designed to mirror the way dolphins and whales move through the water, and it's supposed to be more efficient than a propeller, though I wasn't finding it that easy. It's really hard work trying to drive this sub. 
But that's not surprising as only 12% of my effort is being converted into forward motion. It's taking all of my strength just to get it moving, let alone reach its three mile an hour top speed. You make the C-bomb descend by pushing forward on a lever. This in turn pushes down a couple of elevators at the back. And you steer by twisting another lever which operates the tail fin like a rudder. But keeping it in a straight line is seriously tricky. In fact, I'd say this is one of the most exhausting forms of transport that I've ever tested on the gadget show. But despite my fatigue, the day wasn't over yet. The lads had a further challenge for me. A race against the Sulis, a brand new human-powered sub that was designed to be the Seabomb's successor. The Sulis has a much sleeker look to it, and their pilot, champion sub-racer Benjamin, lies in it head first, rather than my recumbent position. It was going to be one length of the pool, and they weren't going to give me a head start. Three, two... One, go! Here we go. All I've got to do now is keep us straight and level. Come on, Seabomb, come on. Go, 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 go. Of course, this was never going to be the fastest race you've ever seen on the gadget show. Oh, this is so tiring. But it certainly was one of the most strenuous. Come on, come on, I've got to get away faster, faster. Move. And when the Sulis nosedived, I pulled away. Woohoo! I've got him! And a hard-earned victory was mine. I've done it! I've won! <laughs> Whoa! Hey, what do you think? Do you fancy having a go in one? I, I'd love to have a go in this. It looks fantastic, but it also looked very exhausting. Yeah, it was pretty tiring, but a lot of fun. I thought it worked pretty well, actually. Yeah, this propulsion system is really unusual, isn't mm -hmm. it? Loads of work to be done, clearly, to make this uh, win the competition. But I love the idea of the competition you can enter and build your own. Yeah. Hey, potential gadget show territory. Good idea. Who knows? <laughs> Right, now it's time to get back to this week's Robo Challenge. Yes, now, you'll remember that the Gadget Show's very own <sighs> lethal weapons, these two, were tasked with the challenge of creating a fabulous fighting robot. And so, after manfully destroying some fruit, they had just about decided what weapons they were going to use. Allow me to demonstrate yeah. this way, guys. We are going to use two weapons, the first of which was the flipper. The object, you get underneath your opponent, hit the button, flip that button! Dude, oh, you wow. totally messed that up. I want to show you our second weapon, okay? It's a spinner, and it's very similar to this bit of kit. It's designed to deal out some serious damage. Yeah. Oh, obviously, don't try this at home, but let's rejoin the action as the boys begin. Get away with me with that thing as the boys begin to build their menacing robot. Sparks. Big sparks. Our research had gone well. <laughs> We'd been truly impressed by the destructive power of our test robot, but the time had come to build our own fighting machine. Jason, Jason, yeah. after yesterday's training session, yes. we, you know, we realised we liked the flipper and we liked the spinner. I thought I'd go home, like make a model of how, you know, our robot could look. Yeah, 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 I know, yeah. I'm feeling it, man, definitely. It does look a little bit like a dog. There, there is that. <laughs> With the tongue and the ears. Yeah, there is that. And, and the pooping device. Oh, uh, yeah. I tell you what, if we paint it evil colours, we can, like, call it Satan's mutt. <laughs> yeah? Nice! Yeah? Nice. Yeah. To help us, we brought in a top team. Nick, John, Grant and James are former UK champions with over 50 years' experience between them. If anyone can give us a fighting chance, it's them. But first, we had to turn our cardboard prototype into engineering plans. And for this, we used CAD, computer-aided design. Programs like this, Autodesk Inventor, have revolutionised engineering. Now it's possible to build your construction in 3D, have a look at every nut and bolt. Not only that, you can also take a look at the stresses and strains that each part of your construction is likely to be under. And I have to say, she looks gorgeous. Now, the easy way to control our robot would have been to use an RC controller. But when have we ever made things easy? We want to do something really revolutionary, something that's not really been done in robot combat before, and use a piece of technology that really is one of the most innovative pieces of tech of the last 10 years. I'm talking about the Wiimote. 
In fact, we're going to use two. One for movement and one to activate the weapons. This should make controlling our robot much more intuitive. It's so simple, once we're finished, even your nan could do it. But to make it happen takes ninja-level computing skills. Here's how it's supposed to work. I've got my Wiimote, and as I move it around, the accelerometers inside it register the movement and convert it into code. That's then transmitted via Bluetooth to this computer. A couple of bits of software then convert these inputs, and then send them back out of the computer to this transmitter. That transmitter then talks wirelessly to the robot. It's clever stuff. It's also very, very complicated. I just hope it works. While many of the parts were off the shelf, some had to be specially made. For this, we went to Warwick University, where they've got this state-of-the-art, 200 grand computer-controlled milling machine. Perfect for cutting the robot spinner and other key components out of single blocks of metal. That way, they'd be much stronger. It's one thing having a first-class design, but you need first-class components too to compete at the highest level. So we've got a CO2 gas cylinder here, which will help power our flipper. We have two two-brake horsepower electric motors, which are enough to drive our spinner at four and a half thousand revs a minute. And all this construction here, all this metal is titanium, one of the strongest metals known to man. In fact, it's about a grand's worth. Mind your fingers. On there, yeah, sharp. Satan's mutt's horns. While Otis's build was going like a dream, I was having a nightmare. What's going on there? Have we crashed again? We have. Ah! Here's a reboot. Look, there you go. There's a reboot. That's how you treat a PC. But just when I thought it was hopeless, moment of truth, we had a breakthrough. Oh! <laughs> just look at that! Throttle watch! <laughs> oh my gosh! Although we still had a few hippopotamus sized bugs to sort out. Stop, stop! Oh! With a mighty flipper and a high speed spinner, our robot wasn't short of weapons. But we were going up against three very tough opponents, including the European champion. So we wanted a plan B. Hey, hey, this is part of the design you're not allowed to see. It's our secret weapon. Off you go. After working night and day for three weeks and overcoming some serious technical issues, we'd done it. Satan's mutt was ready, and when we arrived at the fight arena, it looked amazing. The only problem was that we had no idea whether it would work, as the first time we got to test it was literally an hour before the first bout. OK, so this is like the maiden voyage, isn't it? Have In you got the miniature bottle of champagne? Not on me. Alright, forget, right, cool. forget it. Ready? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! Look at the speed of it, man! Oh my god! <laughs> this was better than we could have hoped for. Movement check. <laughs> Weapons check. <laughs> Ready to whoop tush check. Oh. But our confidence was short-lived. What's, what's going on? Grant? Robot man. Grant, what's happening? Oh, oh no, you oh, killed the no. robot. It was smoking. It was on fire. It was on fire. No, it was on fire. You're right. <laughs> it was actually on fire, but that was the motor burning out. Yeah. But don't worry, because our team were on hand with extra parts and we got it ready for battle. Hey, do you know what I'm thinking now? I'm thinking that you two might have had this competition when you got, oh, the, you got the confidence. Oh. The question is, did we hand the other competitors in this competition their robo booties on a plate? Or had we just created a very expensive automated robotic doormat? Yes. Would we be the Terminator or the Terminator? Find out after this short break. Welcome back. Now it's time for the fantastically hardcore climax to this week's fantastically hardcore challenge. Oh, yes, Jason and I were set the challenge of creating the Gadget Show's first ever fighting robot. We did the research, met some experts, called upon some computer boffins and put together a mighty piece of tech that we called Satan's Mart. Now, we might have created a CO2-powered twin-engine titanium-bodied mega robot-type monster thing, 
But there were two issues that we had to contend with. Firstly, well, we'd never been in a fight with a robot, and we were facing battle-hardened veterans. Yeah, and secondly, Jason had gotten a little bit overexcited hey. during our one and only test run and burnt out one of our motors. Yeah, but when you've got a new toy, you've got to do a burnout, haven't you? Yeah, that's not actually a burnout. But anyway, <laughs> uh, with a little bit of elbow grease and a few screwdrivers, the motors were replaced. Yes. And we join the action now, just as the competition proper is about to begin. In the, in the words of my nan, God bless her, this could get gnarly. <laughs> The scene was set. The arena was ready. The audience had arrived, and our robot was fixed and ready to deal death and destruction. Excited? You betcha. Gadget show challenges don't get much more hardcore than this. We're up against three of Britain's top fighting robots, including the European champion. Yeah, and to make it even more difficult for ourselves, we're going to be fighting them back to back. Each fight will last three minutes. If after that time there is no conclusive winner, our referee has the casting vote. Yeah, and the, the job of that referee goes to a man who I think it's fair to say is one of the fairest men in Britain, certainly yeah. in the gadget show. Yeah, uh, it's John Bentley. Ah, thank you very much. Are you ready, gentlemen? Yes. yes. To your stations. Let's do it. First up, it's Block of Wood. Hooray! Versus, for the first time anywhere on the planet, the gadget show's own robot. Satan's Mutt! Yeah! Our first opponent, Block of Wood, would severely test our robot's build quality. We knew it would attack us repeatedly like a battering ram, hoping to smash us into submission. It may be simple, but it's also very agile. So would our Wii control system be up to the job of outmaneuvering this wooden assassin? Are you ready? Yeah! Three, two, one, fight! Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it! Take him, take him, take him, man! Do it now, flip! Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. In the heat of the battle, I'd fired off the flipper too soon. It should have reset, but it didn't. It should reset okay, itself! Spin it, spin it, spin it! It was just too new and sticky. This meant we'd have to rely on the spinner and attack our opponent in reverse. Reverse into him! Nice! Right, spin that bad boy! No, he's in front of us, not behind us. <laughs> Block of Wood was proving a very speedy and tricky opponent to pin down. But eventually we got him, right where we wanted him. Oh, oh, take him! Take him! Take him, man! A fight, but we hadn't come out unscathed. The awesome forces exerted on our spinner by combat had worked its motors loose from their mountings. If they came totally loose, they'd rip our robot apart. Plus, in the time we had, we just couldn't sort out the sticking flipper, so we'd only be able to use it once in our next fight. One's got solving arms, got some screwdrivers. Okay, I'm slightly concerned because the guys just used the word soldering iron <laughs> and we're supposed to be in the fight now. And if that wasn't enough, the robot was drawing so much power, over 100 amps, the cable block connecting our drive motors had started to melt, meaning the right-hand wheels had no power. This is not going well, is it, dude? No, no, no. Um... So the spinner could rip us apart, our own spinner. Yep. The flipper only works once. Once. And we can only turn right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this fight on! <laughs> Next up to face Satan's butt, it is 360! We were now facing hardcore opposition. 360 has the most powerful spinner in Britain. Unlike us, it was working perfectly and being driven by robot combat veterans. To beat it, we needed a miracle! Three, two, one, fight! To begin with, we stood back, keeping our heavily armoured titanium front facing the opposition. I'm already really worried about this. Then 360 went in for the kill. Oh! Yes! 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 Got it! We couldn't believe it. It was a one-hit fight. 360 had flipped off our armour and was stuck on its back. It was down and definitely out. Hey. Two nil, man. Who the thought we could turn a weakness into an advantage? We can't move, we can't move. Slap! <laughs> <laughs> but once again, there was a price to pay. The bent metal we could fix, but the drive block was completely melted. We are limping into this final round, man. Yeah, yeah, but we're in the final fight, two up. So I say we just go in 
and deal with it. I love that. You are so Let's right. Let's just do it. With no power reaching the wheels, we'd be immobile, a sitting duck waiting for a stuffing. Desperate times called for desperate measures. For just such a situation, we had something special. Hidden from the opposition, we armed our secret weapon and then entered the arena for one last time. Finally, it's Beauty 2! Even though it's only armed with a flipper, Beauty 2 shouldn't have been underestimated. It's the European champion, for goodness sake. And that flipper can lift a small car. Three, two, one, fight! Wait, go, 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 spin the button, spin it! As we expected, he went straight for the kill. I'm not no, no. We were cornered and getting battered. It was time to deploy the secret weapon. Where? Secret weapon engaged! It was a smoke screen. Beauty 2 would be fighting blind, but thanks to a cutting-edge thermal imaging camera we'd rigged earlier, we could still see everything clearly. Let's go to the thermal imaging camera! <laughs> not, not that it actually makes any difference to people can't actually move! Oh! Oh! No, 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 yeah, 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 we will, we will, we will. Thermal And in the confusion, Beauty 2 hit our spinner head-on. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. Ain't it! Mash him up! Mash him up! But before we could assess the damage, umpire Bentley called the whole thing off. Stop fighting! It would be a judge's decision, but whose side would he come down on? That's very good, but I think the smoke's cheating, really. What? Oh. What? Oh. Points for ingenuity! And, well, yes, but also you're not moving. Beauty 2 is actually sort of whizzing around. I'm not impressed by that. I think this round... Ooh, just goes to Beauty 2. Really. Oh, okay. well, but you did win the other two, yeah. so overall, you do win the challenge. Yes! 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 Come on! Yes! 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 I didn't going? think I could, but I had so much fun that day fighting robots. Oh, right. that was what are you doing? It's a bit emotional. Oh, listen, that was fantastic. <laughs> so well done. Guys, this thing is absolutely <sighs> amazing. Is so, it? Isn't it? Hey, but not without battle scars. No. Look at this here. Look at, have a look at this here. Four mil of titanium look chewed up by the opposition. Yes. And I think that smoke trick, though, was distinctly unfair. Next what? time I judge one of these things, I'm looking for better behaviour from oh, you two. Oh, yeah, come on, Josh. And ingenuity, that's what Ooh, it was. I, don't know. I agree. You know what else this represents? Obviously, with the help of my good buddy over there, mm -hmm. my first win of the series. It is. Yes, yes. Oh, it is. It's, yes. Oh, it's good to be back. Back, well honestly. done. Someone over there has got 100% record this series. Right. Well, I didn't want to wave the flag. Take the shine off. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, don't get too excited about <laughs> it because next week it could be a different story because it's us against the pros fighting for the Gadget Show's honour. Until then, goodbye. See you next time. See Bye. You. Next time on the Gadget Show, we're up against the professionals again. In our most demanding individual challenges yet, each of the four of us uses tech to try and beat the professionals at their own game. Good morning, Doctor. How are you? I hope you're well. John tries to take on and out-diagnose a proper doctor. Getting warm, getting very warm. Otis tries to beat a pool world champion at what really is his own game. <laughs> that wasn't meant to happen! I use gadgets to try and outswim ex-world champion Karen Pickering. Here again! And I try and outgun a proper SAS commando. Go, 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 go! Will we end up with high-tech egg on our faces or can gadgets really help us all come out on top? This is definitely not a show to miss. Run, run, run!